Thank you, Matt. My personal prayers extend to the Kessel family and Jack too. We're all just so devastated to think of that wonderful young man being subjected to such, um, su such a stressful and anxious time for the whole family. I also know all our friends from English Conversation hold loving memories of dear, gracious Spirulin. She was a member of the Bark Choir Society, the Bark Society Choir here in Brisbane, and I have no doubt she will be with the angels singing in heaven when we meet her again. As well as personal family tragedy, Grief and human suffering have been headliners this week from Gaza, Moscow and Taiwan. With many serious problems within our own country as well, we have cause to question, why God? I have to hold on to the personal assurance we have from the Easter journey of last weekend and the affirmation of that today as we share together in Holy Communion. Jesus suffered for all of this ugliness and promised us hope through our own suffering. Let us open our hearts to the God of love now as we pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Help us today to open our hearts to sorry, loving Heavenly Father, help us today to hold to your promise of hope and new life born from sadness and grief as in the first Easter when Jesus walked alive from the tomb and made himself known to his family and friends. Loving Heavenly Father, help us today to open our hearts to your Holy Spirit for comfort in our grief, for faith to keep going through the struggle, for healing of the hurt as we doubt. Calm our fury with the peace that comes from your loving words of wisdom. Friends who reach out with kindness, and unexpected blessings that can turn darkness to light and understanding. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this community of love as we gather to worship, knowing you are with us. We pray that you will continue to bless this place where we gather as family, a generational mix of age, culture and knowledge. We ask a blessing on those who serve in so many ways to honour you and witness to your grace and hope for the future. Amen. A message of encouragement from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. We do not know the author. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace and help to find grace and to help us in time of need. Amen. The reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. And as this reading commences, it's uh, starting with Sunday night of the resurrection. So on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. 
And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, was one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but they are written so that you, but the, sorry, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by, li- by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah. Um, each year as we travel through the resurrection story, our church turns our attention at some point to the reaction of these disciples who had uh, obviously been spooked by the death of their leader, their rabbi. And at this point, when we pick up the story, even though they've heard the testimony of uh, Mary and other women who've encountered Jesus alive, uh, before any of the other male disciples do, they still are not completely convinced. And how refreshingly honest of John to put this detail in the Genesis story of our church. Uh, here is a group of people scared. They have locked the door. They're too afraid to go outside. They're sitting in a room probably with the lights down low because they don't want to attract too much attention. Undoubtedly, discussing over and over again every detail of Mary's uh, meeting and conversation with Jesus. But it's clear that this still hasn't made it to the truth centre of some of their hearts. Uh, For some, it's just still in the realm of possibility. Could Jesus really be alive? For some, it might be, you know, is this 10 to 1 chance? For others, it might be 1,000 to 1. But perhaps their hope is growing. Perhaps they are starting to move from incredulity to believing. Because what they all know for sure is the last time they saw Jesus, he was absolutely lifeless. But they want to be convinced. And they're they're in a space of hoping they can be convinced. And I think this is a place where a lot of people in our world are right now. They're, They're hoping... The story of Jesus is true. They're they're wanting to be convinced. And then Jesus appears, and of course this is a a revelation moment. The the truth becomes apparent to them, and it instantly also shifts their spiritual understanding, and it changes every aspect of their human experience. The first point I'd just like us to grasp is that the resurrection means we can't see the world in the old way because he lives, and the next slide, thanks, Scott. Oh, uh, next one again, please. Uh, because he lives, I can see all of life in a new way. All of life in a new way. A science teacher at a high school had a bumper sticker that said, what in the world isn't chemistry? And, uh, and while he's, he's, that, that is very much true, but... That is also exactly our point. The world is not just and only atoms and the random and the forces of physics. It is now confirmed for us the world is saturated with the presence of God. The entire cosmos is part of God's revelation. So we can see the world now in a new way 
that the reality of Jesus' presence has shifted our understanding of how reality is. The second point I uh, want us to grasp is that because he lives, I can be transformed from who I was into who I will become. And again, we see it's Jesus' actual presence in the room that shifts the disciples from looking at Jesus as certainly their rabbi, certainly their hopeful Messiah, but now with Jesus in the room, their understanding of him has again been changed. And Jesus wants his disciples to believe so they can go forward and experience a new way of understanding reality. And, and all the truths that Jesus tr tried to reveal to them before the cross, they've all come now into focus for the disciples. And, and by his flesh and blood presence there, that authenticates everything Jesus told them before, everything about the kingdom, everything about salvation, about the coming of the Holy Spirit, about our forgiveness by God, about having the faith the size of a mustard seed everything about spiritual powers and opposition, every word that Jesus said to his disciples is now authenticated by the power of God that raised him from the dead. And so before this encounter, the disciples loved and followed Jesus. They certainly believed he'd come to reveal the, the reign of God and the kingdom of God. They had seen the miracles, but when Jesus appeared resurrected, he's revealed as Jesus now with no limitations and total freedom and authority. A Jesus who has changed in, in, into his glorious resurrection form. And Paul emphasizes this truth when he writes in, in Colossians 15. Um, then the end will come when Christ hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. And so Paul's wanting to emphasize this truth that this is Jesus now with, again, total authority and total freedom. The servant king revealing his ultimate dominion and complete authority over all things and yet still coming to his friends as a friend. And so we can see the disciples are beginning to change in that upper room. They're, they're, they were confused and afraid. They're now growing in joy. They're growing in confidence. And, and they've been eyewitnesses now to Jesus overturning the state of death as a finality to becoming a, a new reality. And, and Jesus is living in his resurrection body and things are coming into focus for them. They arrived fearful of being discovered and they leave that place as carriers of an ultimate truth. They are walking out the door with an understanding that has changed the way you and I see the world. And, and these few people were entrusted with the, 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 the story and the message that is going to change the rest of the human story from that point on. Can you imagine the significance of that Sunday evening and that encounter with Jesus? The significance for you and for me and for the world. Because they could never think of life in the old way again. And if it's true for them, it's true for us. We can never see life in the old way again. Rowan Williams was the uh, former Archbishop of Canterbury and he wrote in his book, God With Us, this quote. He said, to believe in the resurrection then is to believe that Jesus is alive and at large in the world. Jesus is set free. He's not going to die again. Nothing prevents him from acting. He's always going to be active and not passive, always at work. And so to say he is risen is to say he is now free to act eternally, unceasingly, without limit. 
death and its effects cannot hold him back. It's not only then that we are brought into the new age, brought into this final phase of human history, that final phase is shaped and controlled by the liberty of Jesus. To say he is risen is to say he is free to act. How is the resurrection reality changing the way you and I see the world? Changing the way that we read the news? Changing the way that we read history? Changing the way that we think about the future? And the third and final point I just want to bring to us today is because he lives, we can receive God's spirit. Because he lives, we can receive God's spirit. Um, just on the next slide, you can see a picture of something I bought for my son, Asher. He started uh, an electrical apprenticeship and I think in the, in the second week I went out and I bought him a voltage detector. Now, uh, I know a lot of electricians carry these around and it's about the size of like, a, as you can see, a chunky marking pen. And it works just by touching the outside of a, a, a power cable. You don't have to actually stick it in the socket. And it only needs to come into contact with the outside of any cable. And if that cable is live, the pen lights up and it beeps. And, and it gives this positive uh, detection or positive proof that the power, the wire is live, the power is there. And spiritually, I think we are meant to be like that too. Where, you know, we I should be able to give to anyone who wants to see the proof of the power of God active and present in the world around you. And especially this Sunday, I can point to no better example uh, for many of you who won't know her, but again, Berylyn, who was this person who emanated the life of Christ in her daily living. And uh, as I said, to be around her was to think there's something really special and beautiful about this woman. There's, there's a, a, an aliveness and an engagement with life which is just so uh, uh, you know, uh, impressive. And you know, what is it about this woman where she has this, this zest for life, even in her old age? And that's where I think people can detect the power of the Holy Spirit present around them and, and allows other people to see that in them and help them to take that step from being interested, uh, a seeker, to that point of being able to say, like Thomas, my Lord and my God. And, and we know there's, there's quite a, 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 a gap to bridge there. But being able to point to the reality of God's Spirit in you and your life through your own living is a fantastic starting point. And we do that when we experience life with Jesus as our saviour and invite God's actual presence to be alive in your place and time. And again, that's exactly what Jesus was doing for his disciples the whole time. He was revealing God-soaked living, God alive around them, revealing the, the presence and the power of God and, and again and again, it's interesting how we hear that it's the expression of the life of Christ in people that draws other people into relationship with Jesus. Other people see something in someone as a confirmation of that reality of, of the life of Jesus. And, and you know, to see Jesus lived out in someone's life and it is, for so many people, a very powerful persuader that there's something more. John, in the, the, the final verse, uh, just, uh, thank you, Scott, reminds us of this. But these events are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And the life you know, we're looking for, the life that everyone's looking for now, is the life that is offered to us by, through Jesus. And, and when we can accept what he is inviting us to receive, uh, to pick it up, to lay hold of it, then life in Jesus is just going to turn everything of our preconceived notions of, of life in the world on its head. And when Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit 
to his disciples and John, the word he's using there means take hold of this, pick this up, you know, take it as yours. This can be yours now. Receive the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus bestows on us the Holy Spirit. And uh, you and I can leave this church today with exactly the same persuasion and power and encouragement that those disciples left the upper room on that night. We can walk out of this building today reminded of everything that Jesus physically said and bestowed on the disciples that night. There is literally no difference. It's an incredible thing. As a good quote I, I read this week uh, in uh, the Lectio Divina, and it said, if Jesus were in the next room and I could hear him praying for me, there is nothing that I would be afraid of. And yet that, 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 that's exactly the truth. You know, Jesus, we're not next room to Jesus, but he has left the Holy Spirit with us. You know, we can leave here with exactly the same reassurance the disciples had that night. We come to the time of our communion. We remember that it was on the road to Emmaus that Jesus was talking with those disciples who were thoroughly uh, uh, um, depressed and, and uh, um, felt like giving up. And it was in the breaking of the bread that they recognised their Lord and Saviour. Um, they recognised the presence of Jesus with them. We invite you to prepare for that own, your own experience now of recognising the presence of God with you in your life today.